This group has a variety of experiences to share when trying to introduce new approaches to legacy projects. You can imagine that introducing these new approaches has made them very well liked and popular in their agencies. Um, and yet, they've found some wins that they will tell us about today. So please welcome to the stage Adrian Abrams, Ashley Owens, Everett Harper, Alberto Colombiera, and Ann Duncan. Thanks. Hello again, everybody. Put up with me again. Um, but I'm going to try and do a little talking and let my panelists do a lot of talking. So the, the reason that we wanted to bring this panel together was, was because we spent a lot of time talking about Agile on, on new projects, particularly on uh, web applications, on things that are relatively straightforward. And the government owns a lot of big, ugly legacy systems that are challenging for us to replace or to modernize. And so we wanted to get a panel together to put their heads together on this topic. And I'm going to start by letting my panelists introduce themselves, tell them who you are, where they work, and some initial thoughts on the topic. I'm Adrian Abrams, uh, formerly a chief product owner for the quality payment program at CMS. Uh, also uh, helped to stand back up healthcare.gov after it had a, a few stumbles. Um, people may have heard about those. Um, and. Um, Initial thoughts, I think, you know, Agile provides a, a mechanism for us to change some expectations on the way that problems are both uh, confronted and then addressed. So I think that's what's been most interesting is to uh, explore a new way to solve problems in the government space. Uh, my name is Alberto. I'm an engineer with the U.S. Digital Service. Prior to that, I was doing digital services effort at the state level in the government of Puerto Rico. Um, and I have some experience in uh, private sector, too. I have, I think my initial thoughts are, I have worked on projects that have attempted to modernize legacy systems, but I have also built legacy systems myself and be part of, of I guess, other people's problems. <laughs> it's part of the problem. Okay. Blame him. Um, so my name is Everett Harper. I'm the CEO and founder of Trust. We are a company that um, spans both government and private sector uh, clients working to modernize, and a lot of times we run into legacy systems. I think my, um, my thoughts uh, concur with a lot of the other folks here, but I think one of the more important things is the mental model and the practice models that need to change to go from legacy systems to, uh, to modern systems. That cultural change that has to go that has to be enacted with people is one of the most important part of this. So it's not just the technology, it's not just the systems, it's actually the people and the way that um, they operate. Hello, I'm Ashley Owens. I'm the Director of Acquisitions at 18F. I'm Southern, so that's 18 Foxtrot F, um, not ATF. Some people think I say that. Um, <laughs> uh, 18F is a civic consultancy, so we're a consulting group that's inside of the federal government. Um, we help partners, um, that's federal government, state governments, local governments, build and buy technologies. Um, and our principle at 18F is to take the agile process and overlay it across acquisitions because in the federal government, acquisitions is what it is. Um, if you've been through it, you might not have had a good time, I'm sorry. Um, <laughs> but when you apply the agile process to it, it can actually be fun and it can be joyful because um, you're getting continuous delivery um, and you're getting faster delivery than you would during the traditional process. So I'm very happy to talk about modern, modernizing legacy projects because um, legacy is what we kind of see the most when we work with our partners. Um, and I'm excited to talk about how you can look at acquisitions um, in a different way to, to make that happen. Yeah, thank you. So while we get started, uh, first thing I want to ask the, the panel is, um, so what are the challenges of doing Agile on legacy projects? So maybe, Alberto, you could start. Agile on legacy projects. <laughs> um, uh, I think legacy projects, you don't know what you don't know, like when you start. And j just taking a step back, like by legacy systems, I think, what do we mean? Uh, I would say just to start framing that, it's like old code base, old code base that cannot be quickly maintained, has lived for many, many years, um, and it's nobody really understands how it works, and there's a lot of functionality interwoven and connected, so you cannot separate like the domains or the features. 
So starting from that point of view, I think you don't know the magnitude of that um, when you start. So what Agile provides you is like a way to figure out and do some discovery, start looking at the problem from different lenses, and try to see what are the smaller parts or little chunks that you can untangle and decompose and start breaking apart, right, and, and modernizing. Um, legacy systems also, I think when we, we talk about modernizing, it's also important to understand what do we mean in terms of are we doing a tech refresh that I call like a one-to-one -one feature parity with newer technology, or are we aiming to transform the whole experience for users? And those are two different games. So I think Agile allows you to do the transformation process better and keep users in the loop because I think these legacy systems usually don't serve users very well. Okay. Um, I think the challenge, if you think about it from like a human-centered way, which is like a principle of Agile, is how to break up with it, right? Like I'm writing a blog post now, how to break up with your legacy system. Because um, like you, you've been with this system a long time and, and y'all have been together for like 20 years. And it's like, but I know I need something new now. And, uh, and everybody's unhappy in this house with you. So, but how? Um, and, and you know, that's what the whole, the whole panel is on. And, and at 18F when we, uh, you know, before they get to me, acquisitions where they've said like, okay, we're gonna spend money on this thing. Um, it's that what you've heard other panelists say that discovery period, like, like you said, you don't know what you don't know. And it's deciding like, how should this breakup happen? And like, spoiler alert, it should happen slow. <laughs> um, <laughs> uh, piece by piece, right? Cause uh, that's that principle of agile is that you're starting off small. And, and a lot of these systems, like you said, they're so interwoven you have to decide like what what is the low hanging fruit what what can be refactored can it be refactored do we need to start over what parts can we build what parts do we have to buy um there are so many questions that you need to ask all with keeping the end user as opposed to the business need in mind before you even get to the step of like what are we going to acquire so i think that's the biggest challenge anyone else want to Jump in there. Uh, I'll concur strongly with this uh, idea. I, I can't top that, but uh, <laughs> I'll concur strongly with this, with the focus on users. And I think, um, I think one of the, the components of this is some of these legacy system, systems that we've seen both in private sector and in public center, sector are also Frankensteins of multiple systems. So it's not just one system. If you've grown through acquisition, if you've had, um, if you've had mergers, if agencies have combined forces, you're pulling together, pulling apart multiple systems. And so a lot of the mindset has been maintaining those systems, not does this deliver. And so again, getting everybody in the room who might have been at either end of these systems and saying, hey, we're gonna use this process called Agile to get everybody in the room and to start aligning on what is the definition of an outcome? What is the definition of done, for example? Those are one of the big challenges from the people side to get everybody on, on at the same, uh, aligned on the same, um, going on the same path. <clears throat> Just add, I think, you know, the, then there's the conversation with the executive where you're yeah. going to go and sell this person on the idea that those one, two, five year plans I have been presenting you for multiple years have been completely fabricated. <laughs> and we will all now agree collectively that they've all been fabricated. And uh, in a truth and reconciliation ceremony, I will, I will present to you a roadmap. And, and as we used to say, it's a foggy day, right? I'm going to tell you what's right in front of me, what I can get done in two, four, six weeks. But if you ask me what I'm going to do with your $150 million over 18 months, I have no idea. Right. And so that becomes, uh, I think, core to getting people to take on that kind of cultural change. And obviously, you're going to have to come up with a solution pretty quickly as to what you're delivering and how you're going to measure progress towards it. But um, that was some of the scariest conversations I had, mm. uh, uh, getting folks to make that shift. Yeah, that, that whole idea. We've, we've basically been lying to you all these years when we told you we know what it would cost and how long it would take. And we've demonstrated it, too, right? <laughs> so they shouldn't I, be surprised. I told you I was smart previously. <clears throat> I'm even smarter now. That's right. So, so, so you guys, several of you mentioned the fact that, these, that we apparently didn't know how to do modular design until you know, the last 20 years. Um, <clears throat> you know, there's lots of spaghetti out there. There are lots of interwoven systems. 
Um, but the other thing is these are often mission critical systems. If you think about, for example, the VA trying to modernize their solutions, right? These are mission critical for them to deliver healthcare to, to veterans. Um, so how do you deal with the fact that you're trying to modernize, use agile methods to modernize a mission critical system? Because of course, in the old way, it was like, well, I'm gonna do this big bang and I'm gonna turn off the old one and turn on the new one, and it's gonna be great. And of course it wasn't. Um, but what, do you, what are you doing now to, to help make sure that you can figure out how to make that shift and keep, thing, keep the lights on? I think that's where it the cross-functional teams of Agile become important. Um, it, you need like you need all the pieces and you need them often together all the time. Um, so you might think your contracts person, yeah, your contract person can write a contract. 18F can write you a contract in three days. That's no problem. That's the, that's the easy part. The harder part is digging in and you need like a product person that's gonna tell you like what's the low-hanging fruit, especially when you're dealing with mission-critical programs because it's like what parts can we turn off when could we turn them off? Um, how fast could this be stood up? Like, that's what a product uh, manager is gonna like kind of help you decide. And, and we take the outputs from whatever that product decision is and we kind of use the modular contracting method to say like, okay, well that means this part of the acquisition needs to come first and, and these sprints need to be a, a part of it. And then you need an engineering person that's also working with that product person, right, to look at like, cause it's not just software, it lives somewhere. Um, you know, I'm just a contracting person, but uh, it has to live in some kind of infrastructure. And what is, what is the infrastructure? Like, what, what, how is this application built? Like, are you moving to a cloud-first strategy? Um, all, all of these kinds of questions. And then you need the UX folks, right? Because you have to be talking to the end users and the end users on the front end of the thing. So like the veterans that are actually dealing with the thing on that side, and then the end users on the back end of the thing that's you know in the agency processing um, whatever uh and it's like blending all of those things uh in in that agile like continuum um often to to slowly figure out how can you modernize it in the least disruptive way because to your point when the the old traditional method everybody's pissed off when you turn something off and you just hand them something new that they never saw and then they give you like a 500 page manual with it to say like oh yeah we're going to do some trainings great yay um just nobody's happy. Quick start guide? Yeah. 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 Right. <laughs> yeah. Here's oh, your quick start guide. Boom. Yeah. Right. Yeah. It'll be great. I think you don't want to be on the critical path um, day one. Like if, if your core, like the core function of your system is Medicare claims processing, just to think about something I've been working on. Um, you don't want to be on the critical claims processing path tomorrow, uh, like third day for, first day, because it has like financial implications, like people's lives are at stake, right? Like there's a lot of assumptions you want to test. So where's, what's the angle you can take to basically try to validate some of your assumptions um, and see what's the best strategy to do this? Um, I think I, I've seen that work out. And also teams that have like, some MVP approaches like minimum viable products and prototypes approaches. What are those things that you can start prototyping and put side to side and see like, is this the right problem? Are we solving it the right way? Are the outcomes for the user what we were expecting, what they need, et cetera? I think there's an, a, a, a difference between uh, product vision and product strategy. Mm -hmm. um, and the product vision, uh, you know, sometimes I, I, I'm separating those two more distinctly can help kind of address that. The vision talking about, you know, how we'd like to delight the end user, you know, what, how we'd like to change the experience that our users are having versus practically what are the nuts and bolts of having to replace an existing solution with the current one and that being the actual strategy and really focusing on those two and realizing that in many cases, especially in the federal space, uh, the strategy is going to lose out uh, or it's going to be impacted maybe more than it would be in the private sector by needing to acquiesce to you know, current ways that business is done. Um, again, but having that vision to say that this is a place that we want to see the marketplace get to or the technology solution or the user experience get to. Um, it's not our experience. One of the things, and just there's a lot of agreement here as well, but one additional thing I'd add is a lot of these systems have lots of interaction effects, right? Um, it's not just one system, and a failure pattern I've seen is assuming that, okay, we know there's mission critical things, but we're going to take this little piece out and we're going to fix this little thing. Um, and it often clangs when you try and put it back in again for a lot of the reasons that, that the group has talked about. Someone's handed something 
um, that they didn't understand or don't expect with the manual, or just there's a problem with the interaction and then it takes another bunch of time to figure out what that is. The approach that we've started to take is trying to almost trying to draw a through line from the beginning of that customer experience all the way to the end and making sure that we can that the first thing we do is draw that line and that is successful person can get from beginning to end and then start to check for where the failures are in between the systems and the handoffs between the systems what that tends to do is when you start to scale it you understand these interaction effects um, much better than if you try to fix a system stand it all the way up and then a hundred thousand users have a problem somewhere else that you can't even figure out where it is Thank you. So several of, actually all of you have at some point or another talked about the impact to people and about in one way or another culture. So my next question to you is, we know culture is really important in Agile. Uh, what are the differences um, uh, and what's the importance of culture in modernizing legacy systems? How is it different from maybe when you're doing a, a greenfield system starting from scratch? So, so whoever would like to jump in first. Sorry. Um, so in a greenfield system, everybody gets really excited. We're going to do something new. We're going to do something different. It's going to be amazing. It's going to be shiny, squirrel, you know, all that. <laughs> um, and the, there's possibility to do that in sort of a legacy system, much more muted, a little bit more, a little bit more um, cloudy, as you say. Um, but I think the, the, the cultural aspect is really... Under, helping people understand that they're going to be doing something different and it's not just the software it's their processes it's their checkpoints it's their authority it's you know all the things we talk about about moving authority to the people who are really closer to the problem well a lot of people may have a problem with that I'm an executive I get to make decisions why am I being paid otherwise don't answer that right so uh, <laughs> the, the, the those processes and systems also will change and so one of the key things that has been that's worked well for us in in both private and public sector has been getting as quickly as possible to saying okay we're going to be in there with you we're on the same side two you made really good decisions back then with the information you had you're not stupid for doing that you did the best you could and now there's an opportunity to do something different and you're going to have to trust us. They might trust a little bit. Then it's about getting to uh, a place where you can demonstrate and show people something new and something different. So this is why, for example, we, we really, really emphasize getting access to customers right at the beginning of the, or end users, whatever you want to call, at the beginning of the, of the process. And in fact, even if they say, we have a lot of data, uh, we have a lot of users like, okay, cool, show us and we'll help you validate that because we're going to bring it maybe a different perspective. Getting them to that point and then showing them something different with all the people in the room starts to build trust because that's the thing ultimately is missing because you're asking people to do something different. You're asking people to do something that's critical, a lot of money, all those things. They have all the reasons not to trust you. So how can you get to that point where you can demonstrate something to a large room of people and then over and over and over. Uh, one quick anecdote. We did this for a client and uh, that first time that we sort of said we're gonna do something different and we're gonna do this demonstration, room was full. You had people who weren't even on the invite list were packed around the wall. We showed them, here's what we've done. It's a work in progress. Great. In two weeks, we're gonna do this again. The next meeting, a little bit fewer people. Every single meeting, fewer and fewer people until it got to the point where only people who actually needed to be there. Why? Because we built trust that we actually said we are going to deliver what we deliver, even, it's, even in a legacy context. And people started to say, oh, wait, this new Agile thing, it might actually have something. It might actually work. Um, from an acquisitions perspective, the biggest cultural change I've seen is um, getting government comfortable being the empowered product owner. So a lot of the, the systems that were either built or bought um, that are now legacy, they don't know what's inside of it. <laughs> um, it's a black box. Um, and it's the reason why they have an email that goes out that's going to be downtime this weekend. 
um, at the end of the fiscal year, like perfect timing. <laughs> and, um, and so it's like shifting that mindset to say like, hey, government, you, you own this thing and you should know everything that's in it. Um, and that's why we implore like, you know, you know, build it in the open and those things when you are uh, modernizing. Um, but shifting them to be like the Empire product owner and then shifting um, cores, contract and officer representatives who manage the day-to-day -day thing to have more of a product management mindset um, as opposed to a project management mindset, right? Um, those are the, the two biggest cultural shifts I've seen in acquisitions. From a USG standpoint, um, we're term limited. So we come to government, we work from like six months to four years, anything in between. Um, so modernizing like Medicare claims processing, for example, is gonna outlive many of us. Because <laughs> um, uh, people do like two years, right? Um, or one year or six months. So uh, a lot of the things we do is build capacity at the agency. And we do that in multiple ways. Like for example, right now, the team we're working on, we have like two discovery sprints that are running and basically we have like kind of two hypotheses and each team is owning one of those. And these are interdisciplinary teams that are basically have like key people from the agency just to learn how to do this, just to be part of it. It includes contractors, it includes like everyone involved just to make this capacity building scalable. Um, we're running as fast as we can, right? And those teams have the ability to prototype things and test some assumptions. And that's the way you could, in, in the private sector you say, fail soon, fail fast, but nobody wants to fail in government, right? You don't wanna be <laughs> in the newspaper cover saying like, oh yes, I'm responsible for the screw up. <laughs> um, so this is where the people can basically fail, right? And failing means making sure that the assumptions are correct or not, and that's how like if they go the wrong path for the users and for themselves, that will be a failure and they're basically like moving away from that. I think, as it was mentioned before, product capacity and like human-centered design, research, those things are key roles for these modernizations. It would be nice if you could have like a nice mix of people in-house at the agency level that can continue this work. Um, from my very, Personal perspective, I feel like the engineering side of the work is the easiest to contract and hire. Um, but having key product and design people at the agency, it's what maintains like the decision-making process, fluid, keeping users focused, centered, and like USES can walk away and the agency can own the path of this modernization. I think in one of the, I think the, the distinguishing factors, at least in the experience I've had between, you know, going greenfield and, and having to replace a legacy solution is in the, is how entrenched the regulation is that you are actually building to. And so I believe fully in human-centered design. I think it's a bit naive, though, in some of those older solutions to not realize that if, maybe for better, for lack of a better way to say it, that like the existing regulation is in one of your users as well, right? And it's one that most of the folks in the agency who have the support of the legacy system have measured themselves to. So as you look to bring users into the room, um, I think in, especially in places where you're trying to uh, replace an existing solution, develop, helping people develop a comfort that you are going to meet the regulatory mandates within the framework of enabling them to move and incorporate things like HCD and user feedback, um, it becomes really vital in, in making that transformation. Absolutely, I can share, we're trying to update our property tax system and one of the key things we have to do is make sure that the answer that comes out of the new system is the same as the answer that comes out of the old system. Because mm -hmm. otherwise, we're gonna spend the rest of our life dealing with property tax assessment uh, appeals. Okay, so, um, Oh, yeah, not, not for what it's been the rest of your life. Yeah, yeah. Well, I'd leave, but other people will be dealing with it. Um, it'd be my solution. Oh, sorry, see ya. Um, so we've been at this, you know, depending upon how you calculate, you know, five, six, seven years in the government, right? Different places have been doing this longer. So, you know, I'm, I'm curious what the how the panel thinks we're, we're doing in terms of making progress, particularly on the legacy side. Uh, and maybe this is an opportunity, I know you guys have lots of examples, so this may be an opportunity for you to share some of the examples of, of things that are going well and maybe some things that haven't should you want to, uh, without naming your partners and projects, uh, uh, you know, to protect the innocent. So. <laughs> Who would like to? 
Mine will be short. <laughs> um, I mean, it's a big ship to turn, right? I mean, so I think, uh, I know for a fact, Agile is more popular. And I always say, um, if an A-suite or a C-suite likes the buzzword, you're already on a good path. Like, because at least they want to say they did it. You know, like, even if it's not the real thing, you have like a, a small opportunity to kind of slide the real thing in there. They're just like, Agile, Agile. Um, the partners that we've worked with, when they come to, we always say 18F is kind of like vampires um, versus USDS. <laughs> <laughs> um, you have to invite us in. So, um, <laughs> uh, but so the, the partners who work with us, they've already kind of drank the Kool-Aid on Agile and they're like kind of already ready for the thing. Um, I do think sometimes they're surprised um, at uh, how integrated it is because like you always hear cross-functional, and then when they get in there and we're doing like co-working sessions together and we're doing like a lot of workshopping together, it's like, oh, this is a lot of together time. It is, yes, <laughs> yes. and you have to trust everybody in this group. Um, so I think for us, it's, it's been going well, and uh, we had a recent project, um, so we have our internal teams that present to us on, on different projects they've done, um, and we redid a portal, I'm just gonna say portal, um, that was uh, critical to, to uh, a need that's here, that's going on right now, um, the opioid crisis. Uh, it, it was put out in the Washington Post. Um, it, it, was, it was put out. Um, but that was a, a really good example of like, you know, back end modernization and front end modernization. And, and these users are like such a, a critical base. Um, and it did not take you know, a long time to, 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 for it to happen, but it was just, it was just employing those agile methods. And yeah, that's just one website. Um, but I think that's okay in the government. Like, I think we should be doing things project by project. Um, I don't think the entire agency just is, just is gonna magically wake up and be agile, but I think the more and more successful agile projects we have, the more and more offices will be comfortable with attempting it themselves. So before the next person answers, do you feel like the offices that you've gotten to do projects, many of them have continued to do agile projects? Yeah, like a, a lot of our business is repeat business because they're like, because once you see it work, it's super exciting, right? Like you, you went from a world where you had a, again, somebody you were with for 20 years um, that you're, you've been ready to break up with for a long time. And it's like, oh, look, this new girlfriend or boyfriend is nice. Um, and, um, they treat me better. Yeah, I want to. I want to date more. Um, so, I need you to leave my, and, eyes, my agile meetings. Yeah. Yeah. This is uh, and in fact, one of our one of our partners, like, uh, it went so well with. Um, we did like a website redesign uh, on the front end, and we refactored the back end, and so like it's a more pleasant uh, process for everybody. And they're like, hey, we got 15 more products like this, and we're like, great. Let's, let's take them on one by one. Thank you. Who wants to jump in next? Um, I mean, I've been in projects where we have changed the way the agency does procurement after we left, um, helped the agency hire people to continue the work in some capacity, um, adopted the cloud, all those things. I think uh, it's really hard to decommission, like sunset systems, decommission systems. That's like the really, like the real, hard problem to solve. Um, it's easier said than done. Um, there's a lot of effort you need to put, um, not only to train your users, but like care about training and adoption as you build the software um, and have like your end users be involved. I guess agencies need to get better at doing that. Um, I've seen like different levels of success doing uh, that work after we have left. And I think that's fundamental to continue the work forward and maintain what they've done. I think like the legacy systems of today, like we're not legacy systems back in their days. I, I remember modernizing the system that won awards uh, in 2000, like as the best web software that the agency did. Um, and 20 years later, it's basically like it was a legacy system. So if they stop there, whatever we did, like our software is gonna be yeah. tomorrow's legacy system. Um, I've seen agencies though that have really invested on not only like hiring but poaching people from other places than other agencies um, and they really want to train their folks. Um, 
that's really important. And also, like the contracting world, it's like key for maintaining this the, this effort. I've seen like the DITAP uh, training and other things, like agencies really investing and in having their folks be part of that. And even if they don't do like DITAP or, or programs like that, just have those people detailed to work in this implementation efforts to learn. And part of the work we do in contracting at the agency I'm working at right now, it's a lot of like bring SMEs to the contracting process just to see how the sausage is made and continue to do it after uh, we move on. Great. Everett, Adrian, either one of you? Yeah, go ahead. yeah um, you know, I, I think it's, um, kind of at a micro level, uh, I think there is a, uh, in the agencies I've worked with, you see some of the support services now moving to agile practices, which I think is really important, right? How are the security folks going to respond to people developing in an agile way? How are the change control boards or gate reviews going to adapt them? So I think it's a really positive sign. Um, you know, I think there's, there's going to be struggles in a place where we're removing uh, some of the stricture and the, uh, uh, around the way that people develop, but I think that that's a, a necessary consequence. I'll say, just personally, you know, I, I had a chance to watch healthcare.gov uh, uh, struggle and get put back up, and I think, um, you know, then working on the quality payment program a few years later, um, they're from a place on healthcare.gov where we talked about technology instead of the cost of insurance way too much. <laughs> I don't know what the right number is, but I know talking about technology is wrong, that part of positive, um, to a place where we changed the way that we pay doctors in terms of quality, and, and that conversation was not about the technology. It was all about what they do or don't like the, the, the policy. And so, you know, that in and of itself is a huge, at least in the healthcare space, is a, is a, is a huge advance, the ability to remove this concept of basic technology from the conversation, um, and, and hopefully that means that we talk a lot less about the technology successes of Agile. So I say, just because we don't, it's almost like the, the lack of hearing about government IT failures will be, or the decrease will be a sign that Agile is working. Okay, um, great. Uh, Everett, anything you want to add? Yeah, I think um, <clears throat> we were also part of the, the you know, healthcare to gov fix, and so it's really interesting to kind of like think back to those days and what things are now much more common. You know, the notion of agile and 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 so forth. Um, I think uh, what I'd add is one another advance that sort of we've seen is sort of the the advent of these technical demos uh, as a way of making choices um, has really I think uh, made a big difference in uh, both the spread of people being able to bid, but also the quality and having some, a different measure, then that wasn't part of the parlance five, five six years ago. Um, I think the, another advance that I've seen is, uh, and you know, both Legacy and Greenfield, is uh, the use of remote. So not the sort of swap the badge out and so forth, everybody has to be on the same site. More agencies are saying, oh wait, there's, along with Agile, there's the ability to work wherever maybe that gives us access to a wider variety of vendors, a wider variety of people, as well as a wider variety of people that we can recruit from. I think that's a big advance. Um, I think some of the, the, the things I'm really curious about came, uh, I don't know if, how many people, I don't know if it was mentioned earlier, um, Jen Palka, a little shout out to her, she wrote this piece on sort of outcome, sort of policy driven um, outcome, I mean outcome driven policy, looking at thinking about bringing policymakers to the table with some of these procurements as well and having them thinking differently and mapping it to the implementation of this technology. I think if, if you haven't read it, it's really fascinating. I've read it once and I don't think I've totally grokked it yet, but I think it's a really interesting provocative idea that I think is going to keep going, uh, keep going further. Great. We, well, just to that point, in the quality payment program, one of the things had a great partnership with USDS on that. Um, and the USDS designers, we were able to, to that point over the course of two years, move the design chain up to the point. Good products are not designed by engineers. Good products are designed in the federal space by the regulation you get. Mm -hmm. And so moving the designers to getting back upstream and starting to, for example, when to put out uh, bills, uh, regulations for public comment, putting them out with screen mockups, right? Mm -hmm. um, just trying to find different ways to start to get folks, especially the folks who give us feedback and comment publicly on regulations, um, something <coughs> different to interact with, mm. and, uh, and also trying to eliminate the rigidity of written technology and regulations that really binds you know, everybody's hands you know, for, for multiple years after, afterwards. Excellent. Um, so I, I have more questions for you, but I want to give the audience a chance if people have questions. 
Go right ahead. We got. Do we have a mic? Mike, do we have a mic for him? There we go. Mark, Mark's got the mic there. He was just having a nap back there. <laughs> Thanks, Martin. Hey, guys, so uh, Bill Pratt from DHS. I'm struggling with this stuff myself. Uh, I was wondering what your takes were, were on this strangulation method where you essentially build a, an infrastructure around your legacy system and then you start, uh, you know, initially just have a pass-through for the connections to that system, and then you turn, as you build the new functionality, and you have to do it one at a time, because we all know you're not going to get two pots of money, one to build and one to keep the checks running or whatever the system is. So but then slowly building the services onto that system until such time where, like, you know, a vine strangles a tree, you can turn off the internal system and, and just go with that one. Have, has anybody had any experience doing that and any, any success? Uh, yes. So I, I think, like, legacy systems don't have that like, compartmentalized like modularity that we mentioned before. So it's really hard to figure out day one, what are the endpoints? So a lot of effort should be put into defining um, what are those endpoints and like APIs could be considered like a way to build functionality using modern technologies that talk to the legacy system and can start be the like the entry point for that kind of pattern. Um, we've done this for pricing of Medicare claims uh, for example, it has a little bit of that. Um, and there's like a set of features you can put on top of the mainframe and say, these are the questions systems and people need to ask. And those could be like the entry points for that type of architecture. That said, I think the, the hard problem is like how the data flow, like there's a lot of more complexity that you need to start thinking of. So I don't think like you could just do like an API strangler method approach to modernize a system. In other cases, I've seen systems where we, instead of like just APIs on top of legacy systems, we have adopted like a microservices architecture. Um, microservices are hard. <laughs> um, like first you should not start framing your conversation about serverless microservices in the cloud like as your golden solutions. That's not true. Um, so. Microservices require like a lot of maturity and the teams that are doing them. And that's where like you need to just go ahead into design work and the user experience and understand like if you have user interfaces involved, it's even harder because you need to make sure that you understand your user experience. You figure out or start playing with different ways to transform that. And then from there you start building what are the APIs and the architecture you need to put in place to adopt such a pattern. And maintaining and scaling that uh, requires a lot of thought and like pretty well trained capacity. Anybody else? Okay. Uh, any other questions from the group? Yes, there's a question. Here we go, right there. I've um, been in the technology space for a long time, and uh, one of my colleagues one day had a I thought it was a really brilliant observation. I wanted to get your take on it. Um, the question was, you know, we've seen a lot of legacy systems, and we've even seen brand new systems that are kind of like instant legacy. Uh, and so the question, you know, it's kind of, right? So, so my, my question was kind of a, almost a rant, or something. Like, why is this that we keep seeing these legacy systems? And he, and he thought for a minute, and he said, you know, to me, the definition of a legacy system is a system that doesn't have a good body of automated tests. Right. He said that even a 20-year-old system, if it has a really good set of automated tests, I wouldn't consider that a legacy system. I thought it was fairly profound, so I just wanted to hear your uh, thoughts on that. I, I, oh, yeah, I was going to say, Go the technical ahead. people, they, they probably have a way better take on this. But my, my acquisition take, just because I find engineering like fascinating, um, I wish I could code. Um, but that's what a, a dev told me because I, I had the same question. Like I, I came into this space as a contracting officer who had bought things a bad way first. You know, like I was that person where a core came to my desk. It's like, oh, we spent two million dollars and I got like a CD-ROM, and I'm like, <laughs> <laughs> but you you approved all the invoices, you know. So like you know, I had this question too. And and his thing to me was, anything can be legacy if you leave it alone. When you just build a thing and then you don't touch it again, 
it's legacy. I don't care if it was two years old, one year old, six months old. It, it just instantly becomes a legacy. Well, I, I haven't seen like a legacy system with good testing, to be honest. It's very <laughs> manual testing. I think like manual testing, it's kind of a signal of a legacy system. Um, I would agree that if legacy system had better testing, they would be easier to modernize actually. Um, and they're probably not legacy systems because those teams are like, on a legacy system, like usually the developers, the maintainers are so afraid of making a change because when they make a change, it has like unintended consequences and other parts of the system. That's the reason in the best case, they do like quarterly releases four, four times a year, if not like once a year, depending. Um, I think test driven development and like those, those methodologies and like those approaches to software development should be like part of the things you procure uh, when you modernize. I have seen like monolithic, so monolithic applications are like this applications that basically contain like all the functionality. Um, I feel like monolithic applications and legacy systems are pretty closed uh, at times. Uh, legacy systems turn to be monolithic. Um, but my point being like, you could still build monolithic applications today and not be like a legacy system, right? I think the cases where I see that is where like the same problems that a legacy system uh, has reflect on the new monolithic application. And those are like not great testing, um, it's really difficult for multiple teams to collaborate, like function, like you, you're building like the, I don't know, like the payment component and you need to understand how the mail system works. <laughs> um, and like it takes like a month to get onboarded and understand everything. And you're so afraid of all the things that need to be reviewed in your code before you push it to production. So I think those are like newer systems that look like legacy system. When you go really fast and you have like budget and time constraints, it's really easy to go down that path. Um, so you need to have an environment where like users and developers can actually take the time to figure out what's best, but continue like the movement and the momentum, so. I mean, I, when I think in the government space of legacy systems, I think of systems that are an O&M. And so then I think, well then, I mean, up until very recently, the goal of every system that we're developing in the government was to make it legacy as quickly as possible, right? Like, how could we get this out of active development? Because that was a sign that was done. Like, okay, we're about to release it to the users, cool, I'm done. As opposed to what we're trying to do now, which is uh, we're about to release it to the users, this is the beginning of day one, right? And that shift. Um, and, and so, uh, it, you know, it, 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 uh, it prevents us absolving ourselves from the stress of like having an active development project going on and kind of always going on. And I think that was the, you know, kind of back to that earlier idea of having, you know, a, uh, the ability to dictate or to, to forecast perfectly what was going to be the future of a product, soft, product software over the next 24 months kind of goes away with that same, same concept. I think O&M oh. is like one of the biggest reasons you have legacy systems in government today because it's like product development stops and you just keep the lights on. You update like the operating system, you do like security patches you, at times because there's a lot of paperwork to like avoid them. <laughs> um, and, and when you go down that path, like you're for sure, the clock's ticking. Like you're a legacy system whether you know it or not. <laughs> and budgets. Budgets are a real big reason why there's a lot of legacy systems. Like, this is the next big fight for me. Like, um, GAO put out all these reports, and most of IT budgets, 75 to 80%, go to O&M. So that means there's not a lot of money left to, to do anything new or modernize anything. So if you have all of budget going to just maintaining a thing, it, it literally promotes legacy. Ever were you going to say something? Yeah, I think uh, two small points on this. I think the if that statement is true, um, you still have to have this, the people and the operations to be able to take that those testing that the results of those tests and do something with them. You know, essentially, it's an opportunity to learn. It's an opportunity to shift and change, and have that legacy system be able to kind of adapt to situations. If you don't have that. Uh, that in your operation, it doesn't really matter. Um, so your your team might be set up to operate a legacy system in which we're just maintaining, we're not doing anything, we're not doing any development. Um, you can have that automation and that team doesn't have the capacity to know what to do with it. We are really strong advocates of in the engineering process itself, 
developing and having an infrastructure for that automated testing so that anything that gets pushed, you understand what the implications are um, right up front. Um, so, I mean, th th those for me are like the two salient points from uh, reaction to that statement. Okay. So we, we concluded that uh, you know, automated testing is necessary but not sufficient to avoid being a legacy system. We are just about out of time. So lightning round question for you guys, 30 seconds or less, so I don't get the hook. Um, what's next? Let's start, Adrian. Uh, I have the fun of contracting uh, uh, with this fine gentleman here to work on the, the modernization of the healthcare claims processing system. Um, that's a small initiative, so we'll see if we can make claims payment for the two plus billion claims that get paid every year slightly more efficient. <laughs> um, yeah, it's just that. Thank you. Uh, there's a Wired article saying like the cool gov works uh, jobs are in government, um, and I think that's true. Like there's a lot of uh, problem solving you can do at a scale that's not come on in government, so uh, looking forward to that for that. Um, and I think uh, Conway Saw, I always think about Conway Saw as this thing I need to destroy. It's basically people build systems that replicate their communication problems. Um, and just, I think that's the kind of one of the guiding principles for the work I do. Um, I think uh, what's next is sort of what I mentioned earlier about the sort of outcome-driven policy, because I think that's the part that a lot of these projects get constrained by. Um, uh, and so I'm really excited about sort of what happens with that and how that affects this field. Um, I think what's next is looking at budgets in a different way um, and looking at how we appropriate that money, looking at what happens after the appropriation phase and, and making IT budgets more flexible or agile to promote more agile. You can't have more agile without more funding to do agile. Okay. Thank you all uh, for a great panel discussion. Give our panelists a great round of applause, please. <laughs>